the next session is very interesting okay and i'm not just saying it because i have to say it i'm saying it because we will be talking about something that has been and kind of like sorry the the person who will be coming out from the brand the, the brand was founded in 1948 based on the belief structure quality backed by values will pay and the same belief has led the company's flagship brand cycle pure agarbatti's to the biggest incense manufacturer the can in the country today let's welcome our keynote speaker Speak Mr. Arjun Ranga, MD, Cycle Pure Agarbattis, and managing partner N. Ranga Rao and Sons, who aims to grow the business ethically, collaboratively, and sustainably. In his address, he will be speaking on enduring legacy, essentially uh, very essential for family business and values. Ranga Avre, sir, Namaskara. How are you, sir? You're on mute. namaskar i'm doing good uh, thank you so much most welcome so over to you i'm uh, really excited to hear from you thank you so much you know when this uh, when i had to choose a subject to discuss today i kept wondering uh, what is the greatest challenge that i face okay, i am a third generation entrepreneur uh, grandfather started this business in 1948 was a real struggle you know the way he set up the business uh, coming into the next generation my father and uncles built the business to what it is today solid foundation and then i've been in the business now for 20 years uh, the biggest challenge and fear for me is whether i will be able to hand over to the next generation something better and something more than i received okay in terms of business value as well as legacy so i kept thinking how do i communicate uh, what we are how we've grown to what we've become and so i've created a small uh, docket a small presentation i'm just going to go over it with you very briefly and once i do that i will then um, you know start a discussion where we can go over my experiences and uh, we can talk in more detail okay sounds good viva all right absolutely so a vision for generations to come that's actually the uh, glasses that my grandfather used to wear uh, we are known as the nr group quickly we have uh, diversified businesses in the group and rangra wansons is a parent business that hands the cycle agarbatti's iris uh, lifestyle home fragrance products lia air fresheners and car fresheners the stopo power bags also the om shanti spiritual products of kumkum turmeric oil and all of that we have a herbal extraction uh, essential oil business called neso where we do floral extracts Rangsan Technologies is predominantly to aerospace and defense with Shusha Technologies. Vyoda, where we do agri solar pumps, Sensop is sensing devices, and NR Foundation is what we are also proud of is our non-for-profit division where we make a real impact in the society that we are living in. Okay, so so enduring legacy, essential family business values. So I want to first touch upon what actually family legacy means. Okay, I tried to kind of look around and I found some good content. in a few sites and a, uh, and few people had written about it and i put in my own words as well so it it's the core purpose of the family business that binds the family values and the business together with meaningful achievements across multiple generations so if we go about and look at you know what we stand for as a business and as a family you will see milestones that the family has achieved and the business has achieved and that actually constitutes the legacy of the family and it has to be documented articulated and transmitted in the right way through proper storytelling okay and that's how a legacy is always paid forward it also represents both tangible and intangible assets that the family has accumulated over the years it could be financial social impact that you made but most importantly the emotional value that a family bond brings so legacy is de determined by the emotional quotient that the family holds so you know in our city i know the legacy that the generation before me had built on the word the ranga family okay and and the responsibility is with me the emotional quotient to be you know taken forward to the next generation also the legacy of a business or of a family uh, it's it's just not about looking back you know to what has been created 
but it also kind of gives us a guideline of what we can expect to achieve going forward about how we treat our customers, how we innovate as an organization, and also determines the entrepreneurship within the organization. So the legacy talks a lot about how we have actually leapfrogged through various stages of evolution of the family and also of the business. Now, one of the critical aspects, like I said, and, and this is one thing that I'm all constantly you know, thinking is about how do I pass on more than what I received from the earlier generation? And legacy is a fundamental part of that because each family's legacy is unique and, and there is no clear cut mantra for anybody to follow to pass on the legacy to the next generation, which encompasses business wealth as well as the social quotient that you've built and the emotional quotient that you've built over the years. Okay. And you know, it could be your bloodline and name, the heirlooms of the family from what my grandfather had. Uh, you know, the other day uh, we were cleaning our house and I found a table that my grandfather used to use 60 years ago. Now I've, I've now moved it to the museum. So these heirlooms are something that's very important part, a very integral part of legacy that needs to be safeguarded. Uh, you know, the stories of the family, what we believe in, all of that. And most families, the legacy also includes the principles, the purpose of the values that underpin both the family and the business. So now that I've established what I think legacy means, I'll now talk about what I have had to experience and what I was handed over. And now I have actually taken the legacy into tangible business um, ideas that can actually be implemented in the marketplace. Okay. And these are the core values that were handed down to me. This has been there from the 70 years of the business. Commitment to relationship with all stakeholders, be it customers or vendors, relationship is the key. Differentiated offerings of products and services through constant innovation. The key word here being innovation and differentiation. Family business values with professional management. This means treat everybody like family, but become professional as soon as you can and get professionals into your business. Ethical and collaborative growth. Grow, but grow ethically and grow together. Transparency in all our operations and conduct. Transparency has been one of the key differentiators for us in our businesses. When I came back to the business in 2000, I could expand the business because we were a transparent organization, ethical organization. So I could focus on growth and building the business and building on our core competence. Okay? So for me, transparency is a key aspect of our core value and be socially responsible and sustainable. So these are the core values that were handed down from, to me from the earlier generation. And I've been able to build on that. Okay. Talk about ethical businesses. This is a ledger of my grandfather in 1951. Okay. If you can see here on the right side, drawing account, this is his tea expenses that he drinks in the office that he books as a personal expense. Okay. He doesn't book it in the company. I can't imagine this level of ethical and financial discipline. And this is what my grandfather did. And, and that's kind of what's been ingrained in us. Right? What is business is sacred, protected, and then the family will thrive as well. Transparency in all business practices. So we were one of the first ones to bring in MRP into our products when it was not required because we didn't want a consumer to be cheated. We needed the consumer to know what he's paying for and what he's getting. We were the first ones to put the net weight in the product as well. Completely onto SAP now. All our distributors, all 5,000 of them are online, real-time, ethical. We also follow global IFRA, International Fragrance Research Association standards for each and every ingredient that we use in our product. They were completely carbon neutral, sustainable. We are the only FSE certified company that uh, one, only Agarbati company that uses only FSC certified boards from regrown forests, 100% sustainable plastic materials we use as recyclable, okay? virgin polymer we use in each and every product of ours. And by 2024, we would have completely offset our plastic footprint as well. So we're, we're working on that also. And each and every product that's manufactured in cycle Agarbati is 100% carbon neutral. We completely offset our entire carbon footprint. So when you actually buy a packet of cycle agarbati from a retail outlet, you can buy it guilt-free and be rest assured that there's been no impact on Mother Earth in production of that product. And collaborative growth, you know, we have all the standards, occupational health and safety is critical aspect for us and, and certified for that as well. One of the proud things for me is our uh, school for visually disabled girl children that we run. Uh, it's been going on for about 30 years now. Hundreds of students have gone through it. Completely blind girl children from rural parts of Mysore, residential school funded by the company. 
we manage that school. It's just amazing. Girls that have graduated from school have now become teachers, doing great across the board. We run a scholarship program for all the shop floor employees, close to 500 of them in the company. All their children's education we fund uh, from the company. Project Prayer Pana is something we're doing in and around Mysore in about 10 slums. We were trying to rehabilitate uh, slum children, get the parents into de-addiction clinics and treatments as well. Apart from that, through our social empowerment for women, through our businesses, we have huge initiatives across the country. You know, in Gachiroli, for example, we are working with uh, tribal women. Almost 2,000 of them have gotten employed making agarbati sticks for us. So this is socio-economic uh, integration that we have been able to do with our supply chain. Close to 20,000 families are impacted uh, you know, through this initiative. Now, for me personally, uh, you know, the sustainability goals that, that UN uh, has determined, I, I put this in every presentation of mine because we all need to be aware. We are all part of the same uh, planet, same ecosystem. Um, these are the 18 goals that the, the UN has set apart, right? Try to eradicate poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduce inequality, sustainability cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions, partnership for goals. So I strongly believe in the sustainability goals and I try to inculcate this in any activity that I do within the organization as well. Right. Ultimately, this is our purpose. This is what we believe we stand for, doing the right thing since 1948, every single time from generation to generation, right? So this is broadly, uh, you know, a high level presentation of what the group stands for. And, you know, Simon Senek talks about the why of the business. And for us, right, uh, why cycle? These are a few of the things that I strongly believe in. And this is the purpose that we are all driven by as an organization. Uh, we export to about 65 countries. We have a legacy of almost three generations of fragrance creation. We follow all global standards. We plant trees uh, that heal the earth for future generations. We're carbon neutral. Uh, we follow all ethical trade practices. Uh, we, are, we are in the process of getting our fair trade certification as well. Uh, we follow GRAS standards, which is generally recognized as safe materials. Um, so, so this is where we are, um, you know, I'm now open to questions. If there's anything that you know, we can have as a discussion as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rangavre. Fabulous discussion. We love uh, everything that you said, but I'm glad we also have uh, Ruhel here. So um, Ruhel is uh, the senior editor for Exchange for Media Group. Ruhel, over to you. Uh, I'm looking forward for this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vaibhav, well. and uh, thank you, Mr. Rao. I was listening to very keenly to what you said, and rightly so. Uh, I mean, so many challenges, uh, the brand in its 73rd year, if I'm right, you know, carrying on from generation to generation uh, with the same vigor and even more. So my first question to you straight away, sir, is that uh, how does the legacy brand ensure that it's not tied to its past and doesn't carry that baggage of... Uh, you know, uh, does uh, away from it and reinvent itself. And related question is how often do you challenge yourself as a brand as you move on from generation to generation? Yeah. So what happens is legacy leads to the values that define your brand and your company, right? I mean, on one side, you're a purpose-led brand that defines how you run your businesses. And then you have the legacy of the family that determines your conduct overall. So there is no baggage at all. There's actually a lot of advantage in knowing where you came from. So you know where you're going. Uh, so for me, I think our legacy actually is determined our future to a great extent. Like I said, Many, many times we are at crossroads and we, we rely on our legacy and our, and our values to determine the direction to take. And we are always right when we go back to our values of ethical business practices, transparency in what we do, social impact and sustainability. So these are things that are part of legacy and, and they're never a baggage, they're actually an advantage. And constant innovation is another mantra that we strongly believe in. As long as we keep reinventing and staying relevant, I think we will always be at the forefront of change and, uh, and adapt to what is required for the family and the business to progress. But for me, I think legacy is an advantage uh, if you look at it in the right way and use it uh, uh, the way it's supposed to, to define the values of the company. Right. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ranga, I also want to ask you about, uh, 
you know, we talk about this pandemic. I just want to revisit. It's been a recent phenomenon for all of us. And everyone, whoever we, uh, whoever we talk to, says that a lot of reinvention happened during this phase. Uh, give me a sense of your story as a leader, because it was about leadership. Only those brands survived and did well who had the strongest leaders. From a leadership yeah. perspective, uh, what are the big lessons for you? You know, the biggest lesson for me is that our values uh, sustain no matter what the situation or the market condition. One of our key values is transparency. So I went out there openly uh, to my entire organization and told them what we were facing. Many of them volunteered to come forward and take payment, uh, you know, uh, holidays, for example. But as an organization, we stood by each and every individual in the company. I was out there as the leader creating uh, town hall sessions. I, I reached out to each and every one of our 3,000 employees on a real-time basis, I was in town halls day in, day out, communicating to them, spreading the message of courage and telling them to stay, believe in themselves and ensure their safety. We also brought in a lot of processes to manage remotely. We uh, moved to a work from uh, home situation even before the lockdown was announced, moved all our systems uh, uh, you know, uh, to homes. We ran simulations as well, went to the bank, borrowed money to be able to sustain uh, salaries for everybody. So we are one of the few companies that did not lay off anybody. And we also managed to you know, ensure that everybody got their salaries on time, whether we were working or not. And, I, and the Agarbatis are not an essential product. So we were completely shut down during both the lockdowns, both during lockdown one and lockdown two. But you know, with the proper planning from my team, we, we were able to sustain everybody in our ecosystem uh, and, and do the right thing every time. So uh, being at the helm of affairs for almost uh, two decades now, um, as a leader, uh, a, a lot of marketers are watching us, young leaders are watching us. They are all watching blogs in right now. Uh, to build an enduring brand that sustains the seasons of all sorts, you know, in terms of the market dynamics, what are your uh, big uh, suggestions? I think believe in your brand. And brand, actually, you need to live what your brand stands for. You need to know why you exist you know, to be a purpose-led brand. See, for me, if anybody asks me, what business are you in? I'm not in the business of Agarbati. I'm in the business of giving people hope. When, when you light an Agarbati stick and when you pray for a better tomorrow, that's what I'm actually fulfilling and that's what I'm striving for. So the purpose why you exist needs to be very, very clear with the leader. And for me, it's very clear. I fulfill a very deep emotive need to each and every person out there who prays. Okay. So once you have that squared in, Everything else falls in place. That's why we have 14 different quality checks. We have such a solid uh, ORM and CRM process internally. That is the reason why we are the largest distributed brand in the country, because we want to be out there helping people's prayers day in and day out, doing the right thing every time. Uh, so you need to be driven by a tremendous purpose, solid self-belief in what you do, and constantly innovate and unlearn and relearn, uh, you know, and ensure the organization also stays relevant. For, for legacy brand leaders like you, sir, I also want to understand during your course of presentation, you also mentioned that sometimes the fear that drives you because you want to contribute more to the next generation that would take on. Uh, one, on the other hand, we often talk about being fearless and relentless. So, so how do we match the two? This is definitely a tough situation to be in. I think fear is very, very important. And to be fearful uh, makes you humble, uh, makes you learn, makes you do more. Okay. Um, and I am constantly uh, fearful, but I also have courage to face my fears. Uh, that's important. So if you just uh, stay fearful and, and don't build a system of courage to actually address your uh, fears, then you'll have a problem. So building process uh, comes out of, you know, being fearful of failure. And I'm a, so, I'm a strong believer in building solid processes to scale for growth. And that, that's really helped me plan, you know, for the future as well. Um, example being, you know, we moved into SAP uh, from uh, micro, from Tally and then into Microsoft Navision. And now we have a Salesforce automation system where each and every, all 1900 of our sales guys have a Salesforce automation app real time where I can track real time sales across the country. These things would not have happened if I didn't, uh, you know, fear technology uh, becoming an enabler and ensuring that each and every sales guy gets empowered to make a difference to his career and learn more. So, so fear kind of manifests in different ways. And mostly, you know, if you understand what your fears are, it manifests in a positive manner. And for me, that's always been the case. And, and, and the biggest fear for me is whether I'll be able to just do justice to this legacy brand and hand it over, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, bigger and better than what I was given from my father and uncles uh, before me. And it's just not for the family, it's also for my employees as well, who are equally, you know, family. Right. Innovation is a great term used by all the brands at most of the times. And it's like broad brushed. But when I talk about how often do you look into yourself as a brand and look into where the deficiencies are, is, is there a time period that brands do it? Because how often do they innovate? Because in an innovation means that you have to move the entire legacy footprint that is so big. How often should brands innovate? Uh, is it tough for legacy brands to innovate and adapt because they have a lot of other things to think about? You know, innovation is not a, a timeline. Innovation is a state of mind. Uh, to constantly look at opportunity, to constantly uh, question uh, what you're doing, uh, to look, uh, to be willing to be disruptive in 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 what you're, you know, in in your activities. So I don't think innovation has a timeline of you know X Y Z innovations that I've done. Innovations manifest into new product development or process reengineering or, or you know digital transformation. So there are multiple ways in which you know uh, innovation uh, shows uh, showcases itself. The way you know that you're constantly innovating and staying relevant is the fact that we've remained number one in the last 40 years. Okay, since 1980, we are, we are the number one brand of uh, incense in, in India. And today by volume, we're the largest in the world. Uh, the only way you can sustain your market share and continue to grow and continue to delight your consumers if you constantly innovate and stay relevant. And that manifests in different forms, technology, social media, product, process, quality, all of that. Right. You know, earlier in one of the sessions, somebody said the quality of a product is the best, best marketing campaign that one can do. Um, of course, your brand has that recall value, but how do you stay differentiated in a crowded market like India, where, you know, the incense stick is like used uh, so profusely? So it's, it's everything. It's just not one thing, right? I mean, uh, it, it's all the touch points that make you uh, different and relevant, being carbon neutral using sustainable raw materials, using safe ingredients, all of the quality tests that we do on the product, all of this then transform into just not a product company, but as a brand. And the brand then kind of encompasses what we all stand for. And that's what a consumer actually buys into. Uh, it's not a transaction, but it's a relationship for a long term. And if you believe in it, and if you constantly keep communicating the same thing over a period of time, your consumers start believing it as well. And, and, and a true uh, representation of that is the testimonials that we receive in our, uh, you know, on our social media platforms about how people talk about generation to generation, uh, you know, contact with the brand and how it's making a difference in their lives real time and how the day wouldn't start without, you know, uh, lighting those two psychological sticks. And so that actually talks about, you know, what you're doing uh, real time. Right. So, so since we're on a marketing uh, forum and also want to talk about uh, how, over the last couple of decades that you've uh, helmed uh, this uh, brand, uh, uh, broad changes have happened in the marketing domain. Uh, so how, where have we arrived now? What are the best ways to touch a consumer who is constantly switching from one screen to another? Yeah. Um, you know, for me, simple basics that I learned when I joined the business still remain. Something like in a retail outlet, jo dikta hai, wo bikta hai. merchandising. That's something basic that you learn. So ensuring that your product is visible, whether it be on the digital space or in the offline space, is perpetual. How do you become visible? How do you stay relevant is the challenge. And the number of mediums have increased. And the second issue is, where is your TG residing constantly? That's been the biggest challenge. The millennials, the baby boomers, and, and the current generation X, who is consuming what, where, and how do I stay relevant to each and every one of them? Digital, social, uh, offline, online. And with the pandemic coming in, a huge amount of BTL activations that we used to do below the line at point of sale has changed because the transaction time in a retail outlet has dropped by 60% for, you know, for um, non-essential categories like ours. So when a consumer is spending 60% lesser time in a retail outlet, uh, the, the, the stories that you can tell him reduces. So how do you then you know, get in touch with him and how do you then tell him what you stand for and what you believe in? So these challenges are real time and we are addressing it through, of course, social and digital. 
and and in, even till today atl still remains the biggest opportunity of you know communication for us you know uh, the other way of uh, addressing the concept of innovation is the disruption that we use we call it disruption in if somebody has to build a brand today uh, the timeline and the age of the brand sometimes gets affected by the disruption some that happens in the market but you seem to be in a very privileged uh, space in that way because the, your brand of course has sustained and no brand has uh, very few brands have this kind of history tell me um, from here on do we uh, when it's the, the vision of the brand from here on what is the vision uh, that you have for uh, your so brand the long term vision is very simple anywhere anywhere in the world anybody thinks of prayer they need they need to think of cycle uh, that's the idea right i mean prayer and cycle need to go hand in hand and the next level of uh, achievement would be fragrance and prayer are together and so that's the way we've defined what we stand for see we are not a vision led brand per se but we are a purpose led brand right um to do the right thing to fulfill hopes to deliver hope each and every time with each and every prayer and that's what we stand for uh, as a as a brand as well so in the long term if you see anywhere there is prayer i want to be present uh, so we have our uh, spirituality website called soulweather.com which is an e magazine we have pureprayer.com which is actually a, a, a an app and a, a website where you can actually go in and do pujas in temples so so we're trying to integrate the entire prayer gambit and entire prayer space we've launched a whole range of prayer products called om shanti where you know you have puja oil camphor all of that you know that you can use right you know um, uh, also like the focus on people behind the brand has also uh, holds in immense significance also i want to understand from you how would you define your style of leadership first of all you know being so successful year after year and uh, target after target how would you define your style of leadership well um, i don't consider myself a very um, good leader in comparison to the leader that mentored me which is my father um, but i believe that i am a very trusting leader i delegate responsibility and i expect uh, and provide the required training and mentorship and 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 then believe in my team to be able to deliver and I, i and one of the beliefs i have is that a leader is one who gets things done without telling people what to do uh, and and i'm a firm believer of that but also you know the paternalistic uh, attitude of of the family comes into me where i tend to micromanage and handhold quite a bit uh, and spoon feed so it becomes easier for my team are to come back to me with problems rather than solutions and and that's something i'm trying to improve upon as a leader as well is learning to let go and let them take the decision and and also face the consequences accordingly uh, but i tend to handhold and spoon feed quite a bit and that's been one of the challenges that i'm trying to overcome as well so so the the leadership well with the leadership stays innovative at all times which is a must in today's uh, you know age that we live in but how do you uh, make sure that it trickles down to the rest of the organization and they have this an innovative first uh, disruptive first approach and uh, we yeah. earlier talked about on the go leadership like you know you you give them that liberty to take big decisions how do you ensure it happens now there are so many processes we strongly believe in you know kaizen's in the shop floor constant and small incremental increments um, a, re- a reward system for kaizen's that happen at the shop floor um, is what keeps us relevant and in- ensures that year in and year out we constantly deliver better and better quality to our consumers so that's on the uh, on, on the manufacturing side we have the best quality management systems in place uh, best in class Uh, we have all the protocols that we follow to constantly keep innovating we have kaizens that we do we have the quality circles we have all of that that's happening constantly so we stay relevant and stay you know focused on what we need to deliver uh, to the customer but the busiest way and the biggest way is through folklore you need to learn how to tell stories of innovation we keep talking about what we keep doing in one place keep communicating that to the other identify champions who can actually tell stories so that through folklore is the easiest and the best way to communicate what you stand for and to tell people how to constantly keep innovating if you don't stay stories you if you don't learn how to tell stories within your organization you cease to be relevant even to them okay so for me storytelling is is the best way to communicate what you stand for and to ensure that the team constantly innovates thank you sir what a wonderful discussion
Thanks for joining us today. I'm sure the people who listen to us go away with a lot of enriched insight. Thank you, and over to you, Reza. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wait, wait, sir. wait, wait. I have a few uh, questions uh, from the people who have been watching us. So, uh, Mr. Ranga, please don't go. Uh, thank you, Rohel. Um, I've I've uh, really enjoyed uh, this entire discussion of yours because I am actually based out of Bangalore, and I know a lot of friends and a lot of families with with the second and the third generation of business. Uh, but then I think maybe the third or the fourth generation now is so overexposed uh, to information and to opportunities that most of them are not very keen on continuing uh, on the family vision. Um, what, what is your take on that? I would, I would love to un understand that before I move on to the uh, questions that the audience has asked. Yeah, see, for me, uh, my father and uncles took the responsibility of grooming our generation, inspired us to come back and join the business. So if my son or the daughters in our family don't come back, I would take it up as much as it's my failure as it as is theirs. So yeah, it is my responsibility to inspire the next generation. And it is, you know, and, and they are always ready to get inspired. I need to show them the opportunity and show them what we can do and what difference we can make to the world if they work with the family and work with this business. And that's my responsibility. So, so if your friends are not doing what you think they should be doing, then you need to talk to their fathers, not to your friends. <laughs> I really like that, you know, so confident, bold and straight to the point. Would love to have more conversation with you. But now I need to get back to my questions. My first question is, uh, this is by Himanshi. Himanshi, thank you for asking in your question. The question is, your association with, the Shri, with Sri Lanka versus South Africa has been very interesting. Uh, how does the collaboration align with uh, your larger marketing strategy? Um, see, we believe that prayer unites people, okay? And we look at cricket as, a, 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 as an activity that unites the nation. And we have just entered Sri Lanka as a market, and we felt that we should partner with Sri Lankan cricket, and that's the reason why we uh, sponsored the recent Sri Lanka-South Africa cricket series. Um, so we have been in India cricket from 2005, and we will continue to be part of India cricket for years to follow. And for us, cricket has given us tremendous brand visibility across the board, uh, predominantly in our trade and, and motivation for our sales teams as well. Absolutely. And, and the kind of prayers that happen during an uh, Indian cricket match. <laughs> uh, it's crazy. <laughs> Absolutely. My, and we'll all be praying today for RCB as well. So. Yes, yes. We are Karnataka boys and we hope that RCB does something uh, better this time. Okay. Uh, my next question to you is, how do you manage to keep your position, uh, positioning intact with uh, in, intact while diversifying into newer portfolios? See, as long as the core philosophy of the brand uh, stays relevant, uh, the positioning in the consumer's mind will not uh, get diluted. See, the, one of the principles that the earlier generation told us that test, stood the test of time, right? They, what my father told us is that don't put your brand on a product if you're not sure of what positioning it's going to take in the consumer's mind. Once you're sure that the positioning is in tune with what the brand stands for, only then you attach the cycle logo onto that brand. And so we still follow that principle. So we don't easily put our logo on every corner of the product so you can see it. So, so that's something that we're following. And that's one of the biggest, easiest ways of how we've ensured that the positioning stays intact because the brand doesn't get diluted. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time. It was fabulous having you here. I'm sure a lot of us got to learn a lot. Uh, I'm not supposed to ask you any more questions, but I'm just going to slide in one quickly. Uh, <laughs> did your grandfather write down something for the family values and that continued down like a book? Uh, because, you know, what, what is said and what is seen, it is lost in a Chinese whisper game. Oh, yeah. No, my grandfather definitely had his memoirs. He's written a book. He's written from 1935 onwards and he's mentioned everywhere that I am writing this for my grandchildren wow. so that they can read this one day and uh, there's uh, almost a 300 page book that he's written for us to follow as guidelines of how to sell what to do how to behave what's important in life what's not the importance of humility and and, and everything is just amazing 
It's is inspiring that, actually. Public, public access? No, it's not, not, not public. Uh, snippets of it has been made public, but there's a lot of personal information about himself that he shares as well in that for us to learn from. So whatever we could make public, we made public. It's a Kannada book called Sugandavarthi Rangarayaru. So, you know, we, try, we will get it translated into English and publish it as well uh, sure, soon. Thank you so much. I'm uh, really uh, looking forward to read that book and having more conversations with you if we meet uh, offline, uh, considering we stay very close to each other, uh, Bangalore and Mysore. Pleasure, Absolutely. Thank you and Jain. Thank you. And thank you so much.